right, folks. Hey, hey, guys. God bless you guys. Guys, I'm really sorry I haven't been around for a few days. Um, I've been digesting the word, and I've got so much to show y'all. I'm almost not sure how to deliver it all. It's mm, let me just say this: uh, the Lord revealing Genesis one, uh, verse two, and verse twenty-seven and twenty-eight. And Elohim said, let us create man in our vain show, representative figure, especially an idol. That changed the face of what is being taught in Christianity all over the world. It literally changed the face of religion forever on this planet. Okay, stop right there. Click. You are totally delusional. The only thing that's changed here is you changing the Word of God. Now, I'm going to post the scriptures as they're written, not as you've tweaked them, okay? Here's a word for you. The Holy Bible, the King James Version, the first book of Moses, called Genesis, chapter 1. In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness, and God called the light day and the darkness he called night, and the evening and the morning were the first day. And God said, Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament, and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. And God called the firmament heaven, and the evening and the morning were the second day. And God said, Let the waters under the heaven be gathered together unto one place, and let the dry land appear. And it was so. And God called the dry land earth, and the gathering together of the waters called he seas. And God saw that it was good. God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed which is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree in the which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed. To you it shall be for meat. And to every beast of the earth, and to every fowl of the air, and to everything that creepeth upon the earth, wherein there is life, I have given every green herb for meat. And it was so. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day.
is the season to be once again entirely misinformed about what angels actually are, what they do, and how they work in the kingdom of God. On panel today to discuss that with me is Josh Peck. Hey, Donna. How are you doing? Good. And unbelievably, we have finally reached the day when we get to say we have this guest. I could not be more excited. We have the one, the only, the illustrious oh master of multiple <laughs> ancient languages, Michael Heiser. Welcome to yeah. Talk Talk. Thanks Chalk Talk. Thanks for having me. Do you want to redo that intro? <laughs> no, I like that a little, intro. A over the top. No, we are keeping it. She gave a great intro, but she forgot to say Dr. Michael oh, Heiser, yeah. so that's how she busts you down a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> It's good, good to see you again, Mike. That's How are you doing? Yeah, thank you. Good to see you guys. <laughs> yeah. You know, what makes this so interesting is I think that uh, mainstream Christianity just as a whole totally gets wrong what angels actually are because, th and this is the way that I was raised, a lot of people were raised, and most people still think, that angel is kind of a blanket term that just means any spiritual being under God. That mm -hmm. there's God, there's angels, there's people, and then there's demons, I guess, and then the devil. And that's basically it. Um, but... The term angel doesn't mean that at all, does it? What, what exactly is an angel compared to other terms such as seraphim and cherubim? Mm -hmm. Yeah, there, there's actually an evolution in the terminology. If you're going you know, by the Old Testament, which, hey, that's the first three quarters of your <laughs> Bible, so it's a good place to start. Right. <laughs> um, there, there are a number of terms. Uh, and I, in the book, what I do is I sort of divide them into three categories. Mm -hmm. There are terms that talk about what a member of the heavenly host is, okay, mm -hmm. in terms of nature, things like holy ones, spirits, okay, it tells you what it is, uh, its essential nature. And then you have terms that really are about hierarchy, uh, sort of a status in the pecking order, you know, in, in the way God conducts business with his bureaucracy. Uh, sons of God is one of those terms, again, the, the language is drawn from the royal court uh, of the ancient Near East, so Again, people would have known uh, what to associate with that term and what not to associate with it. And then the third category is really function or role. So there we're talking about what a member of the heavenly host does, you know, what their job is. And that's what, really where angel falls. Angel is a job description. Mm. In Hebrew, it means messenger. In Greek, you know, angelos, it means messenger. And that describes a task. Mm -hmm. uh, cherubim, seraphim, these are tasks. They're throne guardians. I mean, they're... You know, there are other ministers is another one. You know, you, you get language that describes really what they might be doing at any given point. But our problem is, is we sort of smash all that together. And, you know, we only use one term to describe what, what is really nuanced. Now, as you go in, you know, in the inter intertestamental period, uh, some of these terms begin to be conflated and overlap. By the time you get to the New Testament, even though you have on the, on the dark side, you have a lot of nuancing still. Mm -hmm. Demons are not the same as principalities, powers, and so on and so forth. The good guys, you know, angel becomes a default term. But interestingly enough, some of the angelic vocabulary that is used in the Old Testament actually gets transferred to believers, mm. to human believers like holy ones. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's really curious, but supernatural beings, the good guys in the New Testament are never called holy ones. They are in the Old Testament a lot, but the holy ones in the New Testament are human believers. Oh. So you, you have some shifting going around, and it, it really reflects, again, our status in Christ, you know, in relationship to God and you know, the members of his heavenly host, and you know, some other forces that are going on that I talk about in the book. But in the New Testament, angels are typically good guys. Mm -hmm. um, you know, holy ones are, are us, again, to, to show that we belong in that, in that sphere because we're in Christ. We are made fit for sacred space like they are. And demons is sort of the catch-all term for bad guys in the Gospels, but that's still different, you know, than what Paul's doing. So you lose a little of the nuancing, and there's a little bit of a shifting going on. But to really sort of understand why these things are happening, and even the fact that they are happening uh, between the two Testaments, you have to pay attention to the text. And typically we don't do that. Right. Typically we, we talk about angels and demons in a way that is sort of given to us, handed down by tradition. Mm -hmm. And... We're content with that, mm -hmm. but we miss a lot of what's going on in Scripture when we do that. Isn't the angel, as it is depicted in the Scriptures, something that's actually quite a mighty warrior, something, and, and it's also different from yeah. the throne room angels, and talk yeah, a little bit I mean, about there, that. There, there are a number of different portrayals, and you know, like anything else, there has to be a context. You know, in, in, many, in many instances... Well, I would, I'm willing to say in, in all instances, in the Old Testament anyway, when an angel appeared they were 
not distinct from, from men. I mean, you, you didn't know you were just, you could just be talking to your neighbor. You know, there was nothing visually uh, about them that would say, well, this isn't just a guy, this is like a supernatural guy. You, there's nothing visual going on. Now, when they do certain things, in Lot's case, they strike the city blind. You know, with Gideon, you know, there's fire from heaven that consumes an offer. Okay, we, you know, <laughs> normal people can't do that stuff. <laughs> so there's something else going on here. But visually, you don't get any, any difference at all. In the New Testament, there are one or two instances where there is a visual element, like luminous clothing. Mm -hmm. But there's no wings. Angels are never described as having wings. Uh, there are contexts in the Old Testament where they're clearly, you know, warlike. This isn't somebody to trifle with or mess around with. Okay, the captain of the Lord's host, the angel of the Lord, all that kind of stuff. Um, you know, you never get an instance where, again, they're little kids and buddies and, you know, babies. Or, that's just absent. And again, you don't, you don't get the visual cue of, of wings. I mean, just think about it. You, know, we, you get Hebrews 13, where it says, you know, you, that we should entertain strangers lest we you know, mm -hmm. entertain angels unawares. Well, if they had wings sticking out of their back, you would know. Of course. <laughs> so, I mean, where do we get this idea? And I, I, I talk about that in the book, you know, where these ideas come from, um, how, you know, we, we sort of arrive at this mistaken notion about angels having wings. And it's not a theological disaster. You know, you're, mm -hmm. you're not going to lose the gospel in this. But if you really want to sort of get a grip on, you know, the way that Scripture talks about the heavenly host, then you have to pay attention to the text. You know, you have to set your tradition aside and actually just look at what's going on. So that's what I'm trying to do. So most people would probably be thinking, well, Mike, there are angels in the Bible with wings. You know, what about the cherubim? But that, that goes to this yeah. uh, idea that, that angels and cherubim and seraphim, we're not talking about the same right. types of entities here. Yeah, the, the subtitle of the book is deliberate, you know, what the Bible really says about God's heavenly host, mm -hmm. because not everybody in the heavenly host is an angel. Mm -hmm. Angel is a job description. So some members of the heavenly host are tasked with sent, you know, giving messages. Okay, that's their job. Uh, others are tasked with protecting sacred space, the presence of God. That's the cherubim and the seraphim. They do have wings, but they're never called angels. Mm. That, that's something that, again, if, if you're paying attention to the text, cherubim and seraphim aren't mentioned that often. Mm -hmm. But if you actually look at where they are mentioned, they're never actually called angels. Right. We just take those, that vocabulary and then sort of merge it. And that, again, that's what tradition has done. And so that's one of the, one of the, the reasons why people think of angels as having wings, but then you have, you, you know, you have clear instances where they show up and Lot can't tell that they're not just normal people. Again, mm -hmm. why Hebrews 13? Again, you, there's no, you had, if you had, if somebody came to your door with wings <laughs> out the back, there'd be no mistake. Okay. You, no, no, you're under no threat here of, you know, rejecting hospitality and oops, that was an angel. I mean, how, how, how could you miss that? But, but again, we, we often don't even think about the, the silliness mm -hmm. you know, the, of, of the, the assumption, and you, and you take it to certain passages, and it's very evident that it, that's just not what's going on. So, you know, it, most of what we think we know about angels and demons, we have filtered to us through tradition. And it sounds really goofy, but I, <laughs> I thought it would probably be a good idea to write a book about angels that was actually what the Bible says. Right. <laughs> You'd think like, well, isn't that sort of self-evident? It's like, no, it actually isn't. Because you know? <laughs> we have all this other stuff going on. I, like the, the other passage that I, I think is kind of funny, um, I, I had someone one time say, well, what about Revelation 10.1? You know, the angel descends from heaven. See, the angel's got <laughs> wings there, you know? Well, the verse doesn't actually say he has wings. So the, the issue is descent. And if you look up the word descend there, it's the same word that shows up in 1 Thessalonians 4, when the Lord returns. So did Jesus grow wings while he was gone? <laughs> you know, no. <laughs> you would think in the resurrection narrative that would have stood out. You know? <laughs> but, but you don't have it. Right. So it, it's, these are just words of describing something that comes from heaven. Right. It doesn't require that you have flapping and you know, feathers and... But, aerodynamics but, right, and things. Right, <laughs> right. Yeah, let, let's test it for aerodynamic right. stability, you know. Right. It, but, but this is the way we're taught, mm -hmm. again, by tradition and our culture, you know, to think about uh, angels and other members of the heavenly host. But take a look at Scripture, and a lot of our ideas just don't conform. So that's what sort of prompted the book. 
What do you think about guardian angels? Have we filtered a lot of what we believe as Christians uh, traditionally about guardian angels? Has that, has that been filtered through, or is there a biblical <clears throat> precedent it, for it? It, it kind of depends on what you mean by guardian, mm -hmm. you know, guardianship. Uh, I think there is biblical precedent for the idea that angels are assigned to individuals. And I would also mm -hmm. say to groups like churches, I take the, the angels of Revelation, the early chapters there uh, as sort of being guardian surrogates you know, mm -hmm. of individual congregations. And again, I, I explain why in the book, but the, the, the short path here is there, there is precedent for the idea of members of the heavenly host being tasked or assigned to individual believers to assist them and also to, in the Old Testament, to sort of run interference for them with God, some sort of mediating or advocacy role. And I'm thinking specifically of Job. Job 33, 23 uses the, the word melitz in Hebrew, which means an advocate mm -hmm. or a mediator. Uh, Job 5, when Job is having a conversation with his friends, and one of them says, hey, to which of the holy ones are you going to you know, appeal about what, what's happening to you? So it shows us that there was this idea of angels somehow being accessible and then reporting to God about your circumstances so that they could report back to you and explain why what's happening to you is happening or maybe give you a message. So there's this mediatorial advocacy kind of thing. So if, we, if we're thinking of that, mm -hmm. When we think of guardianship, yeah, you know, there, there, there's scriptural precedent for that. And it's, it actually ties into uh, the whole, and we're familiar with the book of life. But mm -hmm. If you actually go in scripture, there are a number of books, you know, heavenly books um, on my podcast, Naked Bible Podcast. I actually did a whole episode on this, uh, this, this idea that all of human activity is being recorded. It could be good deeds. It could be evil deeds. It could be things happening to you. It could be prayers or whatever. All, all of this is recorded. And the idea isn't to communicate that God has a really bad memory, so aren't we fortunate that he has <laughs> angels to help him? <laughs> right. The, the idea that, that they're trying, the metaphor communicates the idea that God doesn't miss anything. Mm -hmm. You know, God does enlist his supernatural children uh, to partner with him and get things done and run things the way he wants it run, just like he does with us. Mm -hmm. So God doesn't need them. He doesn't need us, but he involves his intelligent imagers um, in whatever task he wants completed. That's all it means. And in this case, it's God doesn't overlook anything. And so that's part of the idea. If, if all this recording is going on, then you can assume, and ancient people did, that supernatural agents are well informed of what's going on with mm -hmm. you. And, and you should, you should you know, ask them, well, you know, you know, ask God why this is happening to me, or they'll give you a message. Now, it's really interesting that that goes... I think that persists all the way up into the Gospels because Matthew mm -hmm. 18 is where you get this passage mm -hmm. about, you know, don't offend the, these little ones because their angels always see the face or the presence of my father. I was just getting okay. ready to ask you about that verse. Okay. So, so that, that, is, that is a direct outgrowth of this advocacy, you know, kind of role for the holy ones. But that changes when you, you, have, when you get after the crucifixion and resurrection. Because then you have the mediator language and the advocate language attributed to Jesus. Mm -hmm. That's when you have, you know, you can come boldly to the throne of grace on your own in, in Hebrews chapter 4. So it, it, the, 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 the work of the cross and the resurrection and the ascension really cause a shift that everything now is funneled through Jesus. Mm. And so angels really aren't, aren't talked about that way anymore. Mm -hmm. There is still a, a guardianship thing going on in, in later in Revelation. Mm -hmm. And that's also drawn in part from you know, Michael's role, uh, who was the, you know, Michael was the guardian of the people of God in the Old Testament, you know, Daniel 12 and other passages. Um, it makes sense because the people of God in the New Testament is bigger that's a bigger entity than just ethnic Israel, right. national Israel. It includes Gentiles. And so the people of God is this collective whole, and it's represented not just in one little piece of geography, Israel. It's represented all over the world in these little groups. So now you have angels tasked with you know, this guardianship role over individual congregations, just like Michael was with Israel. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there's a continuity of thought there, 
But again, the advocacy idea, the intercession idea, that goes away with Jesus. Jesus becomes the lone advocate mm. and the lone you know, intercessor for us between you know, God and us. So what exactly are these, these guardian angels then doing after Jesus or, or, or today? I mean, did they, uh, <laughs> were they all out of a job after uh, <laughs> Jesus no, died? I, or a... I, think, I think the advocacy and the, and the mediation, again, uh, goes out the door, mm -hmm. again, because of the role of Christ. But Hebrews 1, you know, still tells us that angels are ministering spirits sent to assist those who inherit salvation. Mm -hmm. So they do play some sort of assistance role. Again, if you want, if that's the way you parse guardian, mm -hmm. okay, that there's biblical precedent for that. Um, you know, and we've all heard stories about, you know, how different episodes in people's lives where they suspect, or maybe even use a stronger word than suspect, they, they can pretty much know that something supernatural had happened to them. You know, the old, you know, my car was broken down by the side of the road and somebody showed up and when I turned to thank them, they were gone. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. this kind of thing, to, to me that's on the table and has biblical precedent. And I think we go back to a verse like Hebrews 1.14 that, that angels can assist mm -hmm. us in that way. But I, I would like to say one other thing. We tend to think that, that angelic advocacy or assistance only is really happening when we see or experience the spectacular. Yeah, I, I don't believe that. Mm -hmm. I, I think most of the time the way God works is the unseen hand, which is why I like, despite the bell and the, and <laughs> the angel getting his wings, which is why I like movies like, you know, It's a Wonderful Life, because we all can look back on our lives in hindsight and realize that there were these fundamental events, these fundamental decisions that happened, maybe as the result of a conversation or something I overheard or something that you know I saw, or I saw this person do this, or you know, you, you get these these interactions that seem meaningless and random at the time, but that's that's not actually what was going on. They were purposeful, and they were meaningful mm -hmm. in hindsight. And so, if if you know if we can experience that that providence, you know, with with people involved in the story, how would we know whether or not some of those people were angels? Right. And based on Hebrews 13, sure. you know, and, and the answer is we really can't know. So we shouldn't assume, well, I've never had one of these experiences because I never had this spectacular, you know, encounter event. Well, you don't really know that, you mm -hmm. know, a lot of the time it's God working under the radar, you know, kind of like the computer program running in the background. Right. And you, you, you can't really figure it out. And, you know, even with hindsight, you, you might see something there, you might not. That mm -hmm. doesn't mean it, you know, it never happened. Does this factor in at all with uh, our role as, as, as judging angels later on? Like, what is our current relationship with angels, and, and does that change at all in the kingdom? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, think, I think it does have a relationship as far as it, it, it attaches itself to certain questions. You know, like one of the questions I get all the time is, you know, can angels be redeemed? And I think based on Hebrews 1 and 2, the answer to that is no, that mm -hmm. redemption is not offered to them. And the reason I refer to Hebrews 1 and 2 is because the, in, the plan of salvation is intrinsically tied to the incarnation. Mm -hmm. Okay. It, and in fact, <laughs> Hebrews 1.14 actually says it, that angels are ministering spirits sent to assist those mm -hmm. who will inherit salvation. It ain't them. Mm -hmm. Humans are the ones who inherit salvation, you know, those who believe. So if we realize that salvation, the, you know, God's plan was intrinsically related to Jesus, the second person of the Trinity, becoming a man, he didn't become an angel. You know, Hebrews mm -hmm. 1 is full of this. Well, to which of the angels did God do this or say that? Mm -hmm. And the answer is none of them. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's all focused on the son who becomes a man on behalf of humankind. So if, if you look at it from that perspective, you know, you've, you've got this, this sort of singular plan with the outworking of salvation. And that's related to, to the question you asked, because what is our status as believers mm -hmm. ultimately in the kingdom? And this is where, why Paul says to the Corinthians that are bickering among themselves, don't <laughs> you know that you're going to judge angels? Mm -hmm. And, and it, it, to us, it's like a throwaway line. And I, I would challenge you know, your, your listeners and your viewers, go look at a commentary. Okay, I, I, I traffic in, in scholarly research all the time. And I've, I've only found one commentary on Corinthians that has any clue <laughs> as to what that means mm -hmm. because they don't tie it into the larger Old Testament, you know, Deuteronomy 32 worldview where the nations were 
assigned you know, to lesser supernatural beings as a punishment. Mm -hmm. They became corrupt and, and wicked. It creates an adversarial relationship between the people of God and the sons of God who are over the nations. So if our destiny, according to Revelation 2 and 3, is to rule the nations with Jesus with a rod of iron, where Jesus quotes a messianic psalm about us, which is really mind-blowing, and Revelation 3, where Jesus says, to him that overcomes, I will let him sit with me on my throne. Again, that, that's a, that, that should be language only <laughs> reserved for him, but it, it's attributed to us. If we're put over the nations as rulers, who rules the nations now? Well, it's them. It's the sons mm. of God. It's these supernatural, you know, divine beings that have become corrupt and, and, and enemies of God, mm -hmm. we ultimately will displace and replace them. As Paul says, don't you know you're going to judge angels? Oh, wow. You know, you're, you're, you are going to essentially not only displace and replace them, but in, in a sense, we help carry out their ultimate punishment. That's mm -hmm. described in Psalm 82, when, when God says to the, to the Elohim there, the sons of the Most High who are in rebellion, he says, ultimately, you're going to die like men. You know, we become part of that judgment and we replace them as the reconstituted council family of God. Hmm. So all of that, again, a lot of that is familiar theology to a lot of people, but what's not familiar is how it ties into the world of the heavenly host. Right. You know, that, that frames the whole discussion for some of these, you know, common familiar Christian ideas about our destiny. Mm -hmm. But it, it's, it's kind of mind blowing. It's actually tied into the heavenly host. Wow. So this is something that I've wondered about too with this relationship between man and angels, especially uh, when, when everything is reconstituted to, you know, idenic conditions. Because a lot of Christians wonder what exactly are we going to be doing? If we are all, you know, as, as, as Christians, if we're all going to be rulers, who are we ruling over? Is it, is it the, what, the good, the good angels or the good Elohim or? You know, the, the, the ruling language and the, and the judging language, again, is, is the language of hierarchy. Mm -hmm. So we, and I think it's there again to show that we, we're not usurpers mm -hmm. of, of their status, but we are the rightful replacements and we, we help execute the judgment on them that they brought on themselves, mm -hmm. okay, because of their rebellion. You ask, well, okay, after that's done, after they get what's coming to them, mm -hmm. you know, then, then what, is, what meaning does the language have? Okay, I think we, we are mistaken if the beings that are under judgment are dealt with. Mm -hmm. That means there's really no judgment going on anymore. Mm -hmm. And so the, the language of our status really doesn't, doesn't become to be about, well, will I have more responsibility than you know, Josh, okay, will, will, will Josh be working for me? You know, like, right. boy, I can really put the screws to him. Uh, you know? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm in trouble. <laughs> Again, this, this is how we think about it. We think yeah. of, of who we can boss around. <laughs> right. And, and who we rank higher or lower than. Mm -hmm. Again, that, that isn't the idea because now we're all one family of God. We, you know, God hits the reset button to go back to the Edenic conditions, which is why the kingdom in the end is described in Edenic terms. Mm -hmm. It's like the reset buttons hit. Everyone is in correct relationship to each other, which is not hierarchical, but it is partnering. Okay. I, think if, I think if we replace the hierarchical thoughts you know, that are appropriate when we're talking about judging those who are God's enemies, when the enemies are out of the picture, what we're really talking about is we are co-equal partners with Jesus even, because mm -hmm. we get the, you know, we're, we're put on that status by him. And now we are there to do what we should have been doing in Eden. That is, you know, administering, maintaining, stewarding the wonderful creation and, and enjoying it. Mm -hmm. That's our job, as it were. And relating to each other, uh, you know, as fellow imagers, the way we should have been doing all along. So I think it's the reset button that once the enemies are dealt with, once death is dealt with, mm -hmm. rebellion is no more. Again, it goes back to the way, the way it should have originally been. And that is... That's a family. The family metaphor is actually important. Uh, God wanted a family. He wanted co-partners with him to just enjoy the things that he has made. He can enjoy us. We can enjoy him. And that's life in the kingdom. Now, we don't get a whole lot of description of that. Why? Because we mess it up almost from the beginning. <laughs> right. So, so the, the whole biblical story is about dealing with the mess. Mm -hmm. You know, we only get these little glimpses of, of what what it might be like to live in such a system when we get 
you know, heavenly visions or when we see Jesus relate to people. Mm -hmm. Again, there's a reason why Jesus is called the, the ultimate or express image of God. There's a reason why scripture talks about us being conformed to the image of his son. Uh, the, the imaging idea is really important. Uh, we're supposed to be God's representations, God's representatives, his partners. Well, what's our, how do we know how we're supposed to do that? Well, that's what Jesus was. Mm -hmm. It's really about imitating him ultimately. So we get, you get little glimpses of it when you see what, what the way Jesus behaved and how he dealt with people, um, what he taught, what he said. But we don't get a whole lot because we're in a mess. Right. You know, we're in a mess. And, and that's the biblical story. How do we get out of the mess? We, we can see the destination point, which mirrors the beginning point. And again, you hit the reset button. That's about the best we have. You know, this idyllic you know, set of relationships and partnering with God in a perfect world. Well, the best we have certainly sounds a lot better than what we're commonly taught is that we're <laughs> going to be singing worship songs yeah, 24-7. Right. And... I mean, I, honestly, <laughs> I'd be so bored. I'd just... <laughs> just like, can, can we, like, switch songs? Can at, just, least, can, at least another can song. You, can you flip the page at least? <laughs> <laughs> <That's right. laughs> but, I mean, now think about that. Where do we get that image? Mm -hmm. We get that image from Revelation 4 and 5. Right. Okay, what is, what is Revelation 4 and 5? Well, yeah, it's, it's a divine council meeting, you know, the heavenly host and all that kind of stuff. But that has a context. They're meeting about a specific thing. <laughs> it's, it's never designed to say, this is what you're going to be doing when you get here, so get used to it. <laughs> it, it, it never says that. Right. But, but that's the way those passages are preached. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And they're preached as, it's, as if we're not supposed to be bored by the idea of that, you know, right. all of eternity. But uh, it's sad, too, because it's yeah. just one more thing that makes Christianity seem... Ridiculous. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's just one more thing. Chalk Talk tries to address pop culture atheist, uh, yeah. you know, arguments. Straw for, men for arguments, against, yeah. yeah. straw men <laughs> arguments for or against yeah. why we just look like... A really boring bunch of rules. Well, if, yeah, and, and if, if, if the Bible really you're... described that, I'd be with you. you yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. You right. have me. <laughs> yeah, it reminds me of all dogs go to heaven mm -hmm. when he when he finally makes it to heaven, and she's like, "Welcome to doing whatever you wish, laughing and singing all day." And she's like playing a harp, and he's like, "Dude, I want I want out of here." <laughs> <laughs> Well, there certainly are a lot of misconceptions about angels out there. I think this book will help uh, address many of them uh, that we have today, Angels by Dr. Michael Heiser. Uh, th this is absolutely fantastic. Thank you for writing the book and for coming on the show. You bet. Thanks for having me back. Yeah, and again, Chalk Talk's purpose has never been to pitch. We so far have been able to get by with doing this uh, show without ever focusing on any kind of uh, advertising. But remember that uh, currently we do have a thing going on with skywatchtvstore.com. If you order Michael Heiser's Angels, you also get the portent and the facade and the uh, Steve Bancar's uh, and Michael Heiser mm -hmm. interview, which I've also watched and find it fascinating on the book of Enoch, Enoch and the Fallen Angels, all of that for the cost of the Angels book plus shipping. And if you haven't had a chance to do so, make sure you subscribe, click the bell, and if YouTube still doesn't notify you, which it probably won't, hey, if you do get a notification, you won the lottery. We figure about one in every thousand actually <laughs> gets a notification. Just know that uh, every Wednesday at 9 a.m. Central, you will get a new episode of Chalk Talk. Well, this has been an absolute blast. Take care and God bless. <laughs>